Five cold cases solved decades later. When a crime occurs, police immediately set out to solve it and catch those responsible. Some cases get solved right away, others can take weeks or even years. Then there are those cases that can stretch over decades, but through a stroke of luck and a little digging, authorities are finally able to solve them. These are five cold cases solved decades later. Number five, Tracy Gilpin. On the night of October 1st, 1986, 15-year-old Tracy Gilpin of Kingston, Massachusetts headed to a party nearby her house. By 10.30 p.m., her and her friends decided to leave. Her friends walked with her until they reached their own homes. Shortly after dropping them off, Tracy went inside a convenience store and bought a pack of cigarettes. The clerk remembered her and said she called someone on the payphone while there. She had called the owner of the house that threw the party. She asked her if she could pick her up at the convenience store and drive her home because she didn't want to walk alone anymore. However, the woman said there were still people partying and so she couldn't leave. Tracy eventually decided to keep walking by herself, but this would be the last time anyone would ever see her alive again. When she didn't come home, her parents and family weren't initially worried. She often spent the night at a friend's house and forgot to call in. But when her friends started calling and asking where she was, her family knew something was wrong. Police were called and she was then reported missing. Three weeks later and 14 miles away, a woman walking in Miles Standish State Forest in Plymouth discovered the badly decomposed body of a teenage girl. It was Tracy. The 15-year-old had suffered a massive fracture to her head and police believe she was killed the night she disappeared. For the next 30 plus years, despite multiple searches and tips, no one was arrested in relation to the murder. But police in Boston recently announced they were working with cops from North Carolina to bring in 61-year-old suspect Michael Hand. On the night she disappeared, Hand was hosting another gathering in his Brooksdale Street home in Kingston where Gilpin was last seen. Tracy, Melissa Cavaco, Hand and another man were present, but he said the gathering happened weeks before she ever disappeared. Then, later, he told a story about seeing Tracy with an older man in a Ford Escort on the day she went missing. The man was later identified as Henry Menholtz, and he has been ruled out as a suspect. Han said he and another friend followed the car to the state force but lost sight of the vehicle. Minutes later, they found Menholtz coming out of the woods with a tarp and shovel. However, he later gave a different account of the story, saying he was in the forest when he scratched himself on a rock. He said he picked up that rock and dropped it on the ground and that's when he heard a thud. Looking down, he noticed it had fallen on Tracy's head by mistake. At one point, Han told investigators he was sorry for not being completely honest throughout the past interviews. He was then arrested and charged for the murder of Tracy Gilpin. He entered a not guilty plea and is currently awaiting trial. Number 4. Death of Richard Phillips and Milton Curtis on January 22, 1957, El Segundo, California police officers Richard Phillips and Milton Curtis stopped a vehicle after it ran a red light. Once outside the car, without warning, the perpetrator pulled out a gun and shot both officers three times before fleeing the scene. Officer Phillips fired three shots into the vehicle and radioed for help before losing consciousness. Officer Curtis was pronounced dead on the scene. Four blocks away, the killer ditched his car and ran through neighborhood backyards while he got rid of two stolen watches and a gun. Apparently, prior to being stopped, the suspect had held four teens at gunpoint before he bound, gagged, and robbed them. He also raped one of the 15-year-old girls before taking their watches and stealing their 1949 Ford vehicle, which was the one officers saw beating that red light. A massive manhunt ensued, but it led nowhere. The last break happened in 1960, three years after the incident, when a homeowner found the gun and two watches in his backyard. These items were processed and partial fingerprints were obtained, but it didn't lead to any arrests. The case was left open, but it remained cold for more than 40 years until September of 2003 when police received a tip about the identity of the killer. This was a fake call but it caused police to run the old fingerprints on the newly created nationwide fingerprint database compiled by the FBI. To their surprise, it matched a print for a robbery held in South Carolina in 1956 done by Gerald Mason. 
Gerald was known to friends and family as a friendly man and model citizen. He was a wealthy retiree with two gas stations, a family and grandchildren. When his fingerprint was matched with those recovered on the wheel of the stolen vehicle and his handwriting compared to the receipts for the gun purchase, he was arrested. When confronted with the evidence, Mason fully admitted to the crime. He told police he was intoxicated when he stumbled across the teens and when he encountered the police officers later that night, he wanted to cover up for the rape, robbery, and theft he had just committed. Mason pleaded guilty to the crimes and was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences. He was denied parole in 2009 and later died in prison at the age of 83. Number 3. Murder of Maria Ridolf Snow had begun to fall on the evening of December 3, 1957. Seven-year-old Maria Ridolf begged her mom to let her go out and play with her best friend and neighbor, Kathy Sigmund. It was dark out, but the two went on the street and played a game called Duck the Cars. Kathy would later tell police that it was then that they were approached by a young man named Johnny. He said he was 24, unmarried, and asked if they liked dolls. Then he inquired to see if the girls liked piggyback rides. Maria accepted, and after Johnny gave her a ride, she went inside their house to grab a doll she wanted to show him. When she came back, Kathy went to her house to get mittens, and by the time she came back out, Maria and Johnny were gone. Kathy then told Maria's family, and when they still couldn't find her, they called police. Within an hour, authorities were searching the area for the young girl. They interviewed neighbors and witnesses, but no one saw a man playing with the girls. When the FBI came on board, they traced the timeline and agreed Maria was likely abducted between 6.45 and 7 p.m. Five months later, and approximately 100 miles away from Sycamore in Woodbine, Illinois, two tourists searching for mushrooms around U.S. Route 20 found the skeletal remains of Maria. She was wearing a shirt, undershirt, and socks, while hidden underneath a partially fallen tree. Since Maria wasn't taken out of the state, the FBI withdrew their investigation and left it to state and local police. But prior to the FBI leaving the case, they interviewed potential suspects before the body was found, and one of the suspects was then 18-year-old John Tessier. At the time of the disappearance, John lived with his family just two blocks away from the Ridolf home. He had been planning to enlist in the U.S. Air Force. When his alibi was investigated, John said he was 40 miles northwest of Sycamore to enlist in the Air Force. On December 3rd, he visited the Chicago recruiting station, corroborated by records, then spent the day sightseeing. He returned to Rockford by train that night and arrived at 6.45 p.m. He made a collect call to his parents asking for a ride home. Phone records showed a collect call was placed to the Tessier home at 6.57 p.m. by someone named John. After that phone call, John met enlistment officers at Rockford to drop off paperwork. They confirmed that they did speak to him at 7.15 p.m., and because his alibi checked out, the FBI closed the file on him completely. John went on to serve 13 years in the U.S. military, and later on, he became a police officer in Milton, Washington. But in 1982, he was charged with statutory rape after abusing a 15-year-old runaway. He pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor and was sentenced to one year of probation and terminated from his job. By 1994, he changed his name to Jack McCullough, and by 2011, he was already in his 70s and living in a retirement home while working as a security guard. In 2008, the case of Maria was reopened after Janet Tessier, John's half-sister, confided that on their mother's deathbed, she supposedly implicated John as the perpetrator. It was also revealed that John allegedly raped his other half-sister, Jean. State police reviewed the evidence and created a new timeline to make room for him as a viable suspect. In 2012, John was tried in DeKalb County for the rape of his half-sister, Jean, and the kidnapping and murder of Maria Ridolf. The former case was dismissed due to a lack of physical evidence, but as for the kidnapping and murder of Maria, he was charged with the crime despite a lack of physical evidence, motive, and indication he was in the area when the crime even happened. Pressure from both the Ridolf and the Tessier family led to the conviction where John, at the age of 73, received a life sentence. In 2015, he filed for an appeal. Richard Schmack, the county state attorney, reviewed the case and found out that key evidence pointing to John's actual whereabouts in Rockford, 40 miles away from the crime scene, were kept out of the trial. 
This evidence, which was the collect call he made according to phone records, would have supported his alibi that he was not in the vicinity. With the icy road conditions taken into consideration, it would have literally been impossible for him to have driven 40 miles within minutes to abduct Ridolf and eventually show up to drop his papers off to the enlistment officers by 7.15 p.m. in Rockford again. As a result, he was immediately released. On April 12, 2017, John was officially declared innocent of the crime and to this day, no one knows who killed little Maria Ridolf. Number 2. Diane Jackson Diane Jackson was a 25-year-old single mother from Houston, Texas, who headed out to work for the day on December 14, 1969. She pulled up her car into the company parking lot, but she never made it into the office. Later that day, a man named William Bell saw another man walking away from a shack located near the office building. Curious, he decided to look inside the shack, and when he peeked in, he found the body of Diane. During the investigation, police discovered the woman had been raped, strangled, and then brutally stabbed to death. There were no immediate suspects, and the only thing police were able to collect from the victim's car that could possibly point to a killer were latent prints found outside the vehicle. This was then filed away, and the case eventually went cold. After decades of advances in technology, the brother's victim, David, expressed an interest in retesting and re-examining the case in 1989. David had become a Texas State Highway Patrol officer and later joined the Texas Rangers. He asked Houston PD to review the case and the witness reports as well to see if there were any new leads. The Houston PD also ran their prints in their updated local database along with the Texas Department of Public Safety's automated fingerprint identification system, but nothing came out of that search. It would take another 14 years before the case received attention again. This time, the latent prints were prepared by examiner Jill Kincaid to be run against the FBI's newly established nationwide fingerprint database. Searching through over 70 million offenders, it yielded 20 possible matches. Jill then checked each one individually and positively identified a match in a man named James Davis. Davis had been in and out of prison several times throughout his life. In fact, he had just gotten out of prison just nine days prior to the assault and murder of Diane. After the latent print identification, the lead investigator found the suspect living along the Texas-Arkansas border. Since his fingerprints were obtained on the outside of the vehicle, they needed a confession to convict him. When Davis was interviewed, he was visibly shocked when police questioned his whereabouts between 1969 and 1970. He also became nervous when showed photos of the victim's vehicle. He then eventually pled guilty in court and was sentenced to 34 years to life in prison for Diane Jackson's murder and rape. Number 1. Jacob Wetterling On Sunday, October 22, 1989, 11-year-old Jacob Wetterling, his brother Aaron, and another friend Aaron Larson were riding their bikes on the way home from a convenience store in St. Joseph, Pennsylvania. Right before reaching home, a man with a stocking cap mask and a revolver jumped from a driveway and ordered the boys to throw their bikes in a ditch and lie with their faces on the ground. The man asked the boys for their ages. Jacob's brother at 10 was told to run into the wooded area and never look back or else he would be shot. Jacob's friend Aaron was 11, just like Jacob himself. The perpetrator demanded to see the boys' faces, then he told Aaron to run away and not look back, threatening to shoot him too. He had chosen to keep Jacob. About 10 months prior to Jacob's abduction, a 12-year-old boy named Jared Sherrill was abducted at gunpoint. He was sexually assaulted then threatened by an adult male. The perpetrator had the same M.O. as that of the Wetterling abduction, also threatening to shoot the boy if he looked back. This happened just 10 miles from where Jacob and the boys were stopped. Despite the investigation, nothing ever panned out. There were persons of interest, but no evidence to stick to them. One person questioned on December 16, 1989 was Danny Heinrich. DNA of his was collected, and it matched the one in the Jared abduction. However, the statute of limitations had expired on that case, so he was never charged. It wasn't until October 2015, 27 years later, when Danny was named publicly as being involved in the Jacob Wetterling case. 
Even though he was linked to Jared's case, he wasn't charged and so instead a search warrant had to be issued and detectives discovered child pornography resulting in his arrest on October 28, 2015. He then led detectives to the remains of Jacob, where he had been buried in Painesville, 30 miles away from their home. It was confirmed through dental records that this was Jacob. As part of a plea agreement, Henrik wasn't charged with Jacob's murder, but instead to one count of child pornography. He also testified on what he did to Jacob after the abduction, where he said he handcuffed the boy, drove him to a gravel pit, and molested him. Afterwards, he shot him after hearing sirens in the distance and noted he was able to elude police by listening to a police scanner. The following year, he reburied Jacob's remains after noticing his jacket had become exposed from the original burial site. Even though he is sentenced to 20 years in prison, the judge said that it's unlikely he will ever be let free because of the heinous nature of his crime. So there were five cold cases solved decades later. Some crimes are never solved, and without leads, it can seem sometimes that they'll never be laid to rest. Eventually, though, as you can see in these cases, as long as there's hope, the truth can find a way. If you like this video, then remember to subscribe to our channel. We have new videos coming out every single week that we know you'll enjoy. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.